pleased to have uh, Damien Elias with us. He's an associate professor in the Environmental Sciences Policy and Management <coughs> Department. Uh, got his bachelor's at the University of Arizona, a PhD in Neurology and Behavior from Cornell. Uh, was postdoc at the University of Toronto and the University of British Columbia. And he works on animal behavior and animal communication. And particularly, uh, he's going to talk to us today about how animals communicate in a way that's a little unfamiliar to, to you or I through vibrations. So thank you very much, Damien. Well, thank you for the invitation, um, and it's always fun to come and talk about my favorite topics. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, um, before I start to sort of introduce you to this world that um, is basically unknown to us, is basically talk about why it's hidden. Um, there is a very real reason, um, and I think that it really touches about a lot of how we construct science, of why this has been unknown for so long. So I'm going to sort of pose this question. What is the purpose of studying biology? Um, and I think the easiest way to think about it is what is funded, what are the funding agencies that do it. So there's one major one, right? So there's to improve human health. Most places, most countries that have large um, programs that fund science have a particular thing that's going to be for uh, looking into biomedical research. The National Institute of Health is the thing for the US. Um, so this is very applied. Um, I will posit that there's another version of this, which is a little more aspirational, and this is to understand organisms and the principles that govern physiology, how animals are working, their internal workings, their behavior, how, they, how organisms interact with each other, their ecology, how they fit into the, in, with the natural world, and their evolution, how these things change through time. And so Basically, one is, is focused on humans, so I'm going to leave that behind, because a lot of what I'm going to, going to talking about um, is a little far away from humans. But I think what at least one of the things I aspire to is to understand the natural world, what is out there, how it works. And so if we talk about this, how do we do this? So as scientists, we do scientific research on living organisms, of course. We go out there, and we look, and we study them. Now, the assumption when we're trying to sort of come up with these broad rules and principles that govern biology is that the organisms, the organisms that we study are representative of the diversity of life on Earth. I think that's the basic assumption. But there's this one major problem, and this is what I'm going to call taxonomic bias. So what do I mean by taxonomic bias? OK, so I'm going to give you um, some data from a couple fields of biology. Um, we don't really, there hasn't been any study that goes across biology, so I'm just going to go through a few of them. So this is um, data on conservation biology research. So if you look across the world, this is how vertebrates, invertebrates, so things like um, insects and spiders and plants, this is the representation of how the world actually is to our best world to our best knowledge. If we look at the research on these organisms, this is how it looks like. The majority of work, the majority of conservation biology work are on vertebrates, and it's not representative of what is actually out in the world. If we go to my field, animal behavior research, you find the same thing. So chordates here, so vertebrates, arthropods, spiders and insects, things with crunchy exoskeletons, and then everything else. Yes? I'm just curious, how were those numbers uh, then? Was it, was it by numbers of species, number of animals, biomass? So it was by estimates of number of species and the other one, and the, what, how it's represented as number of papers on those particular groups. So, okay, so... This is the representation of numbers of papers in animal behavior, behavior research across these particular groups. Now, if we actually were looking at it in terms of what we estimate the world is like, it would be more like this. So we are really basing everything that we do on core dates. Every, our basic principles are being designed and being thought of in a very select group of animals. If we look at, now this is work looking at biodiversity research, so what are the animals that are in natural history collections? What are those work doing it? Here, you find something where you have, if they're green, it has, these are situations where they are research in excess of what they're actually found in the world, and this is if there is uh, a shortfall. And so as you see up there, we do a lot of work on birds. We know birds very, very well. We overestimate 
uh, the how we do things on birds. And if you look at down here, things like insects, we are severely underrepresenting them. So I think this is important because as biologists and as people that write textbooks, as people that we're trying to really understand and kind of appreciate the natural world, the way that we're constructing our world is very different, very, very different for how it actually is. So if this is how the way the world is, most of the world is an arthropod. Up there in that little, little box uh, would be us. <laughs> Scientific research is actually looking, constructing a world like this. Most of the world, most of what we think of is based on a very select, very small group of animals that are not representative of the diversity of life on Earth. Now, the funny thing is that not only is this in the real world, but also in our imaginings of the world. So this is the data that my postdoc collected from Wikipedia. If you look at Wikipedia, the number of entries for fictional arthropods is 54. So there's shout outs to Shelob here. If you look at the number of fictional bears, <laughs> the number of fictional ungulates, and even the fictional badgers. There's more badgers than there are arthropods. So how we think of the natural world is primarily based on the organisms we value. So what are the things that we value? Well, we, or we value things that are related to us, primates, mammals, vertebrates, things that as even as, as you know, and I am very, um, and I do this all the time, you know, you go out into the world, you're out in nature, you're hearing all these beautiful bird songs that really, really sort of evokes the, the, the kind of the, all those little things that you really like love the natural world about. We also tend to focus on things that are large, things that we can very easily see. And we also tend to or focus on organisms whose behavior conform to some cultural expectation of what is natural. So I'm gonna sort of now talk about what is probably the least controversial of the bunch that we um, are focusing and building the world and our understanding of science on things that are large. So why would that matter at all? Well, now I'm gonna talk about sound. So, what is sound? Sound is basically vibration waves that travel through a medium or solid before reaching a sensory organ or an ear. So if a, if a, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there around, it's not sound, I guess. This is what this would say. So I think important here, so solid, right? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So what this means is that you can think about in an acoustic sense as sound being potentially one of three different things. There is airborne sound. This is what you are hearing. We are very good at detecting airborne sound. It's a lot of the ways that we navigate the world. Um, I'm gonna play a video of one of my favorites. Bird here. This is a lyrebird. It mimics sound. It is mimicking a child's ray gun right there. Now it's going to go and basically sing a whole bunch of this bird song from Australia. That's a camera clip. Another camera click. And that's a kookaburra. Absolutely incredible. And yes, I would love to study these guys, yes. There's, as a, there's airborne sound, so what we appreciate. There's also, of course, waterborne sound. So this is waves that travel through water and animals use to, this to communicate. So you have whales, and I think all of us are very familiar with that, at least in media representations. Also amazing, a little harder to study than those birds. Now the last one is substrate-borne sound. Now what substrate-borne sound means, and I'm gonna give you a lot of examples of this, is vibrations that travel through solids. So you, think of, you can think about an animal sending vibrations on whatever it is that it's standing on. So it could be it could be soil, it could be a leaf, it could be a plant, um, it could be a web, anything that is solid and they produce vibrations that travel across it. So I'm gonna give you this, this, uh, this, this kind of statement and I'm gonna sort of like uh, back it up. Substrate-borne sound is by far 
the most common sound used by any living organism. So why? It's very simply that most animals are small. Most animals are much smaller than us. So the, the majority of life on Earth are things like insects, spiders, worms, blah, blah, blah. And so why would this be a case? Why would substrate born sound, why would small things uh, do that more? Well, let's first talk about airborne sound. So very simply, you can think of airborne sound happening where you, you can have low pitched signals, so really low uh, types of sounds. They're low in frequency. The waves, it means that their wavelengths are very, very long. Kind of, uh, and at the same time, you can emit high pitched songs, so very high, high pitched songs. And those are high frequency, and they have very short wavelengths. Now, if an animal wants to produce, to wants to create an airborne wave, they have to cause air to vibrate. They have to push a lot of air and cause it to vibrate so it propagates very far away. So if you're small, it's very difficult to push a huge amount of air so that it could propagate for a far, for very far. So for small animals, it's very hard for them to push, to put enough energy into air to move it. So it's very difficult. And this is based purely on physical, on physics. Now, the problem is that they could just make higher pitched song, higher pitched songs, but then you get at the situation where the physiology does not let them do that because it's really impossible to fire a muscle thousands of times per second. So the physics makes it really hard to make wavelengths that are going to propagate in any sort of meaningful way. And the physiology doesn't let, they have not developed um, a po like potential ways of doing it. Now, of course, I, I hope at this point you're saying like, what are you talking about? I hear acoustic insects all the time. Okay, crickets, right? We're very familiar with crickets. They're making airborne sound? Sure. <laughs> Here's another one. This is a tree cricket. Another obviously very evocative one is a cicada. Cicadas are, all, are, are very common. It's a very, it's an animal sound that is very sort of uh, familiar, especially if anybody spent any time in fields in the East Coast. There's some other animals that, uh, weird animals that make airborne sound. Here's a tarantula. You're hissing. So, so what am I talking about? So across insects, only 5% of insects use airborne sound, while 90% of them use substrate-borne sound. So we're moving around the world. We're hearing all these beautiful insects uh, sing. But those are a very small proportion of what the, most of arthropods are actually doing. So why? Well. So it's much easier to produce waves when you don't have to push as much as the medium to propagate across it. So you don't have to move as much. And so you only really have to create a wave on the surface. To show, just to illustrate it, this of course isn't a solid, but it's similar types of things happen. When you have these little insects creating these ripples across this wave, they're not moving the entire body of water. They're only moving a little tiny bit on the surface. And that, and, I've, and that, of course, can really propagate really far distances. So it's much easier to produce vibrations in any wavelengths or any frequencies that they want. And also, of course, this makes the physiology a lot easier to do. The muscles can fire fast enough to produce waves that transmit a very long distance. And just to show you data here, this is from my lab. Here you have this little machine that is producing um, vibrations the way an insect would. And so what you can see here is that you can have these small amplitude vibrations really transmit very far on plants. So it's actually a really good way for an animal to do these things. So I think it's important also to say that, you know, these substrate borne sounds are not just limited to insects and the data I just talked to you about. Spiders do it. I'm going to talk a lot about spiders. A lot of my work does it. It's also crabs frogs, rodents, marsupials, and even some of the really giant animals like uh, elephants. They use substrate-borne sound to communicate across miles. And they do that because airborne sound, they would not be able to communicate across such large distances. But because substrate-borne sound can travel so far, that is one of the reasons that they have developed this very interesting way of producing sound. So, 
why did it take so long for biologists to start studying subject-borne sound? Of course, it's because humans cannot detect subject-borne sound. We're big, so we're really great at detecting airborne vibrations. So for a long time, we just didn't know that this is what they were doing. A lot of really interesting papers um, from a lot of very, uh, a, there's a lot of papers, and um, a lot of people started studying uh, a lot of um, model systems on spiders in the 60s and 70s. And it's a very major thing. It's like, oh, they're not producing anything. They're moving their bodies, but they're completely silent. And it was because they were producing substrate-borne sounds. Now, interestingly, we've known that substrate-borne vibrations have been important to some fields of STEM for engineers. So why? This is my favorite vibration. Of course, this. Tacoma Bridge, Washington, opened only a few months ago, was built at a cost of over $6 million. But misfortune overtakes the great structure. These are some of the most amazing pictures ever recorded by a newsreel. So you got the actual collapse of right the there. world's third largest suspension bridge. So engineers um, have known that vibrations are important, um, that they're pretty significant. And in a way, they're the ones that were able to develop the tools that we now use, that I now use as a biologist, to measure uh, vibrations. So this is kind of one of the major ways that we do it. This is a laser vibrometer. Um, that's kind of like the details of it. You basically, what you do is you shine a laser on an object. And basically, if the object is moving, if, if the object is moving towards you, the reflected laser beam, which is what it detects, is going to be shorter. If it's moving away, the reflected laser beam is going to be longer. And then you can reconstruct um, that in the device to really um, be able to uh, measure how much a surface is moving. Now, the cool thing, and which is what I'm going to sort of play for you now, is that you have a little tiny insect that's producing a vibration. It can't, because it's too small, create airborne sound. But I can now play it through a speaker. Um, and that is a big thing that's going to produce sound. So now we can actually hear it as airborne sound. So I'm going to play you a lot of videos. And so it's basically what they would be detecting on the ground. But because we can have a big thing now producing these vibrations, we'll be able to hear them. So all of this was developed by the automotive and aeronautic industries. Um, and also, there's been a lot of recent advancements, which has made them a lot cheaper uh, and a lot smaller because we now care a lot about things that are vibrating. So things like disk drives and things like that, we need to make sure to engineer them well that they don't break because they're shaking so much. So I'm going to play now, just go through some of the, the interesting diversity of substrate-borne sound. And kind of before I kind of jump into it, I just wanted to give this example just to hopefully show just how common these things are. So this is my building. My office is uh, over here. When I first got my vibrometer, I wanted to know if it worked. And I basically went to the back of VLSB, found a little patch of grass, created, caught a bunch of bugs, brought them back to the lab. This is kind of like, these aren't the bugs that I caught, but they're kind of like this. They're the little things that flip around in, in grass. And I shone a laser on them. and. The songs I'm going to play are things that I recorded from there. Now, interestingly enough, um, these songs are probably you're one of the first people to hear these songs. They're not known by science because there are so many that have not been recorded. So this is the type of things you hear. That's one species. That's another one. That's another one. So now let me just go through some of the cool things, just some of the diversity of substrate-borne sound. I'll get out of the way here. So we're going to start off on the top left. This is a katydid. It hits its body against, the, against containers. This is a video from Jane Yaks lab in Carleton University. These are these little caterpillars who communicate to each other by drumming on surfaces. This is a little, uh, little wasp. This is an ambush bug. So here we now have a, um, a crab. It's uh, trying to uh, interact with this female that's glued to the stick. <laughs> and that is from uh, Patricia Backwell's lab from the Australian National University.
And this is a this is a wolf spider. Now, I like videos, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna play you a few more. Hope you guys don't mind. So this is Habernatus clauseri. You can all find this in your gardens. Um, I remember once um, being in a parking lot uh, in Oakland uh, waiting for a taco, and I found them hopping around in the parking lot. They're very, very common. And so I'm going to play you kind of an excerpt of their display, and then between them you'll see some high-speed video shots in black and white and uh, showing what just happened, just to show you kind of there's a lot of details that uh, we can't see, and so it's just a pretty fascinating thing. And they also sound like motorcycles. I really like this because you can't really tell when you, it's going that fast. So they always do one of the flicks. This is about to happen. So the first one is always super fast. And then the second one is much slower and actually touches her. Yeah, exactly, and then through the floor, and it would be transmitted, and then the female will detect it with receptors on her feet. How does the properties of the floor change the sound? Very, very much so. I'll talk a little bit about that. It becomes uh, one of the reasons that I think this is an, a, a very important thing to sort of study, because it really matches, it really lets you connect physics of the environment to the evolution of behavior. Now, I wanted to show you these two last videos. These are um, these are a recent work, um, and the two videos I'm going to show you are from Australian endemic uh, spiders. Here's the male. Here's the female hiding under the leaf here. is a peacock spider. And so I wanted to play those um, basically because those are Australian species. And of course, Australia is on fire right now. Um, and you know. We, of course, um, have been hearing a lot about um, marsupials and all of the really unique um, Australian vertebrates. But the truth is that uh, this kind of um, environmental catastrophe is also having effects on the things that we aren't considering, and these really small things that are very unique and, of, and are all over Australia. So of course, if you have the means, please donate to these causes if you can. It's a very, very big problem. 
So with that kind of like sad note, I'm going to transfer over to like what my lab has been doing. And um, what, I, what my lab has done is try to use substrate-borne vibrations as a window to try to understand uh, more basic principles about different aspects of biology. And so I'm going to talk about three different projects um, that have been going on in the lab. One on, on species evolution, a little bit on temperature, and then finally on anthropogenic impacts. So, what I'm first going to talk about is animal communication. So before I get into that, I wanted to sort of quickly just set the stage for studies of communication. So when we talk about communication, you have to think about it in three different uh, kind of steps. You have to think about the sender. That's the thing that is producing the signal. You have to think about channels, so the environment that, the, that a signal is being transmitted through, and the receiver. So the idea behind communication is you have a sender, and it wants the receiver to do something, say spin around. And so what it's going to do, it's going to produce something that is going to, to try to modify the probability that the receiver does what it wants it to do. So the way that it does it is that it would produce some type of signal energy, some type of energy, something that will modify the percentages, and then that gets transmitted through a channel, and that the receiver has to detect it, and then make a decision. Does it do does it do what the, um, what the sender wants it to do, spin around, or does it do something else? Now, what I'm going to be talking about right now is the channel, because in substrate-borne communication, this is the thing that becomes incredibly important. Now, there's this idea that the channel is going to modify the signal or what happens through it. So if you can think of a sender producing some type of energy, imagine this being representative of every potential energy that it could be produced. As it gets transmitted through the environment, the environment is going to modify it. And so what you put in isn't necessarily what you get out. So what evolution does is it favors the signals or the energy that is going to be transmitted the best through the environment. So you don't have everything possible, you have the things that are going to be transmitted best. So if you only concentrate your energy in these bands that pass pretty well through the environment, then you're going to have a much more efficient signal. And this is what's known as the sensory drive hypothesis. And this is this hypothesis that the environment of an individual determines the effectiveness of its behavior. And so Natural selection, so evolution, is going to drive the evolution of signals that work effectively. And this is going to happen through habitat transmission, so selection for signals that pass through the environment without degrading, and perceptual tuning, selection for sensory systems that are best adapted to detect the signals in the environment. Yeah? Uh, so you're talking about cases where organisms want to communicate. Yes. Yeah. And there are also be situations where like vibrations are either inadvertent or they want to deliberately camouflage? Very, very much so. So um, there is a whole field of research where you'd be talking about eavesdroppers, predators that are moving in the environment that are using those cues to do it. And then sometimes, for example, if you want to avoid a vertebrate predator, a bit a large vertebrate predator, it might be better to do a substrate-borne vibration than do an uh, acoustic one. If you're trying to avoid a gi giant tarantula, then it might be easier to do something else than the substrate vibrations. And so what I'm talking about here specifically are things that would have to do with mating signals, comp competitive signals, or things with, um, with parent offspring. So things that you do that there are sender and receivers, and there's selection for both of those things to, to work in concert. Yes? Now, sensory drive has been um, a a, a big hypothesis in the animal communication literature for, um, for many years. But one of the things about it is that it's always been considered to be only through one very simple channel. So for example, um, if we're talking about this group here, we're talking about the properties of water. The, is the water cloudy? Um, is the water filtering different colors out? Or things like um, airborne sound is the um, environment that you're trying to send signals through. Is it, is it uh, open? Is it closed? But what substrate-borne vibrations do, do is that because any solid is a potential channel, what you have is an incredible diversity of, of channels that an animal, can be, an animal can use to communicate. So 
one of the reasons where my work has come in is trying to understand how animals can adapt to this incredible diversity in potential channels. So I'm going to talk now about this little species here. This is Habernatus lucenus. This is what it does. Very handsome beast, I think. So what we wanted to know was basically to understand how the physical environment, how the channel environment, how the animal that this animal is standing on, how that impacts their communication. So to do that, you go to the field. Uh, this is a picture from one of my field sites. Uh, it's in Arizona. I, it's very, very beautiful. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, the problem, though, when you're doing field work is a lot of the times you spend the time looking at the ground, not looking up. Um, and for all the eagle eye bunch, there's a spider there. So these animals move around a lot. And so you can imagine, as the animal is moving through, it could be sitting on a rock. It could be sitting on a leaf. It could be sitting on these sticks. That each of the places that it's standing on could be do very, very different things to its signals. So what we did is we went out into the field and we collected female spiders. We would collect the female spider, take her back to the lab. And we'd also collect the thing that the female was standing on. And then what we could do now is try to play vibrations through everything that we found the females were standing on and look at what happens. So the way that I did it is I um, tore apart an old turntable. It's nice because it has a counterweight, so you can dial this to be the weight of a spider, and then the thing dips, dips down, and then you can vibrate the particular substrate. And you can place it on it, and you can basically put a signal that you know the properties of. You can you know what you put into it. And using a laser vibrometer, you can see what comes out of it. And so you can compare the input to the output to create a function that will tell you how the signal is distorted or not. And so you get something like this. You get these curves. The thing to, um, I'll explain it in here. So um, there were three major things that we found females on. We found them on rocks, on leaves, and on sand. So this is what it looked like a rock. So the thing to notice is that so if what you put in was exactly what you got out, you would get a straight line at zero. So that would mean that there was no distortion. Anything below that zero means that those vibrations didn't pass that well. And so you can look at how far it is below and any shape in this. So by this, vibrations pass pretty poorly through rock. But relative to the higher pitches, they're a little better at the lower ones. So that's what the way rocks look like. This is the way sands look like. So very different, different shape. They're actually pretty good at these higher frequencies. What's the x-axis? The x-axis is uh, frequency. And then this is uh, attenuation. So how much the uh, thing gets, um, gets pushed down. And this was leaf litter. So the important thing from this is that, yes, the environment, the properties of the environment are very different from anything, from all the different things the animals are standing on. And if you map where the signals are, what you would predict is that females of this group would really only accept males on leaf litter if they cared about the vibrations. Everything else distorts their signals in, in different ways. It's pretty bad here, maybe a little better at the lower frequencies. This is really bad at the lower ones, maybe good at the top. So do females care? So what you can do is you can just put males and females together on these different substrates and make sure that they only can interact on those um, surfaces. And when you do that, you get this, which is great, right? So this is the proportion that copulated. These are the three different substrate categories. So females were much more likely to accept males when they were on leaf litter surfaces than they were on sand or rock. So their signals are designed to work effectively in one of the things that they're on. Now it's interesting because we found the females on all of these different surfaces. So their communication is only working on one very specific channel. And 
we thought that was really cool because one of the things about this group is that there's a bunch of species that are found at the same spot. If you went to Del Puerto Canyon um, a little bit, you can find 10 species of these spiders. They're all over the place. They tend to overlap quite a bit. And for this population, what we found is that here's these things before. So let's assume I'm not crazy. Hibernatus decennis is a leaf litter specialist. We looked at this species here. So this is Hibernatus osculatus. So very, very different song. They have a very low pitched song. And even though you can also find them around, you can find them on like little pebble, on um, little pebbles. So they tend to be found on rocks. If you wanted to produce a signal that is going to do as well as possible on rocks, it would be at these lower pitches. This next one here, Habernatus conjunctus. These are animals that really like um, sandy riverbeds. And so they have a very broad signal. So you could imagine that if you want uh, to have an effective signal there, you would have a higher pitch than it eliminate some of these lower pitches. Science is complicated, of course, so there's some things that don't do anything. This is Habernatus halonii, also found there. This is a really beautiful mustache and these little sparkly legs. Um, and what we think is happening with this group is that they have basically foregone this habitat specialization, and basically they're found everywhere but in smaller numbers. So we think that one of the reasons that maybe invertebrates are so um, diverse is because they really are able to specialize in all of these different environments. That because they can evolve specialization even within this larger, um, this larger one, this allowed, given them the opportunity to diversify. Okay. Does this correlate yeah. then with where the males sing? So they don't bother to sing on a rock if that's not their preferred? That's, that's a great, great question. What we think is happening is that males are moving around the environment looking for females. And then females, depending on their receptivity, are found in spots and not others. So males are just looking for all the opportunities. Okay. They, they sing yes. They're, the drive is very, very high to do that. Yeah. Are there species that uh, adjust their vibrations depending on what substrate they're on? So um, there are. In jumping spiders, we haven't found that. In some other spiders, they do do that. And so what they would do is um, they're ones that produce these visual signals and also vibratory signals. And they kind of adjust how many they do depending on what they are. So there is feedback on in certain groups. Yeah? Great question about how the spider transmits to its medium and, and how that contact might change. We've, We've been, been thinking, thinking a lot about this uh, and, and, trying, and, and we're, th we're probably going to do some experiments to do it. There, um, Feet are very, very hairy, and so we think uh, that happens is, be, is they're basically like, like, the, like the geckos. They're just like stuck really firmly onto the ground because they have these, all of these hairs. And so, uh, but we are looking for those contact points and seeing how the vibrations change through the body, through the feet, through the ground, and really adding that complexity to it. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is the effects of temperature. Uh, and this is work that uh, my lab has, uh, has recently been doing. And the, what I'm going to focus on here is how animal communication is affected by variation in temperature. And I'm going to talk about it in two species of spiders. And the prediction, before I get into it, is that if you have a stable communication system, one where the rules are set up between males and females on what is a good male and all of those particular things, then mating is going to be robust to environmental shifts. So if you have something in the environment that changes the behavior of the sender, it's also going to have the same effects on the receiver. So what do I mean by this? So this is a pretty famous example. They teach uh, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts this. You can tell the temperature of the environment by counting cricket chirps. There's a nice little formula. You can figure them out, and they can tell you the temperature. And so as temperatures increase, Crickets get, cricket chirps get faster. This all has to do with metabolism and physiology if you're cold-blooded, if you're an exothermic animal. Now, the important thing is as male chirps are getting faster, the female response to it is also getting faster. So at higher temperatures, they like faster songs. And that change in rates has, um, is sort of equal into what males are doing and what females are doing. So across environments, 
the same number of males are going to be selected for. It's going to be stable. The system is set up so at temperature A, um, at temperature A, um, the right male is going to be um, mate. And if you make the male go faster, the female then is going to correspondingly like faster males, and she's going to select those same individuals. So we looked at this in spiders. This is work from my lab from Erin Brandt, who is now a postdoc at the University of Western Ontario. So she looked at a whole bunch of different things. I'm going to play you the buzz that, from that spider that went, that type of thing. So three different temperatures. This is what it sounds like when it's cold. This is in room temperature. This is warm. So very different, I hope you can see. So one of the things that she found is that if she looked at their behavior at those same temperatures, again, what you would expect if it was stable is a straight line. The female would be accepting the same amount of males. They would not change depending on temperature. What she found was very, very different. What she found is that females were behaving very, very differently at different temperatures. At cooler temperatures, now these are temperatures that were selected particularly in things that they are out in the world moving around at these temperatures. So it's not like putting them in a freezer and, and anything like that. So their behavior when it's cooler is much different than when it's warmer. And it's huge, right? So you go from a 0% uh, mating rate to about 50% mating rate. So everything is changing. And what this suggests, so as temperature increases, the signal gets faster and the mating rates increase. What this suggests is that this is an unstable system, that the rules governing the interactions between males and females in this context are changing with temperature. So why is this the case? So this is going to be work now from my postdoc here, Malcolm Rosenthal, who's been working on this jumping spider, uh, this wolf spider, sorry. And this is the way they, this is what they do. I'll play that again, just because it's so nice. So they do a whole bunch of different things. Um, if, uh, if you have any details and questions, I will, I, I could like be really, uh, I can really be very detailed about this. I'm going to be kind of broad scale, but. Okay, so this is a song. The song is made up of a bunch of different components and a bunch of different notes. And the first, the songs change in complicated ways with temperature. Um, a similar to how I showed you with those buzz displays, as you get faster, they're going to get faster. But I think importantly, not only do the individual notes change, but the structure of the entire song changes. These are networks of the song, and so basically what these represent is how different pieces of, the, of this song are put together. Um, and these are at three different temperatures. The details of it aren't important, but the fact that at different temperatures, these networks have different shapes. And just to go, it's like this is the same uh, component on all of them, so that the way that they are linked in the overall song structure changes with the temperature. So as temperature increases, the notes themselves are changing, but the way the song is put together is also being modified and changing as well. So you have very complicated responses to temperatures. Now, you find similar complicated ways on how receivers, so choosers in this case, are selecting at different temperatures. So this is a very complicated heat map. On this one, you'd have temperature. On this, you have a, um, a variable of the song that's not so important, but some character about the song. And so if you had a stable, um, temperature and choosing relationship, what you'd find is basically a line. But what this shows you, because you have these very complicated shapes, is that females are selecting different parts of the different attributes of the signal differently at different temperatures. So really what the work on substrate borne communication and temperature is showing us is that temperature can have very complex effects on animal communication. And these are things that are not usually considered, right? So when we're thinking about impacts of climate change, we're talking about species distribution changes or animals not being able to survive, like say, increased heat. But what this says is that these temperature effects are potentially or likely occurring on things that we're not measuring. They're working, um, they're changing the way animals are communicating each other. They're ch changing the way selection is, and evolution is occurring on the different things that they're doing. There's a lot of very subtle effects, which has very strong impacts. 
Can I ask it, if an animal won't mate at the low temperature, why is it bothering wasting his energy to make a song? Very, very good question. I don't know. It has to be that, like, um, that vanishingly small percent, that, that little bit of time that they could, that they may be able to get it is worth for them to do it. Maybe it's their selection never to try to miss any opportunity. Could they have another reason to try to tell other males to stay away? Uh, so the one interesting thing about this is that females only mate once, so I think that's one of the reasons why males are really, really uh, trying at any situation. But yes, you would think that a more fit male would tune its behavior to the environmental conditions. And we're, this is obviously a lab experiment, and so one of the things that we have data for is actually tracking what individuals are doing in the field at different temperatures, and I think that will be like a more realistic one. We differentiate between the temperature of the spider and the temperature of the floor. We've done both. So we do thermal camera measurements so we can get um, the pixel size isn't that like intense, but we can very... Um, we can get uh, very precise measurements of the floor, and that's how we're manipulating it, but we're always measuring the temperature of the spider. We also have a new system that we are going to be running experiments on where we have an infrared laser that's going to track a spider, and so we can have a male and female at different temperatures where one is being heated by a laser, one is not, and we can really disentangle the effect of the environment um, from the from the individuals, and so we're really excited about doing that work. So, are you using the temperature of the spider to infer what temperature it thinks it is, as opposed to the transmission media? Yes, yes. we have not worked on, and that is going to change, right? So, like temperature is going to affect a lot of the stiffness properties of like substrates, and that is something we need to know. And in desert environments, those those surfaces are getting real hot. So because each part of the song is produced by a certain body part, mm -hmm. um, are females always listening for males with really excellent abdomen? Or are they you know, expending more energy, more to limit their energy at different temperatures to emphasize that? I mean, that, that's a great question. And this really goes into trying to sort of um, figure out what females care about. And the idea is that one of the reasons that they use so many different structures is that females want multiple independent measurements of how good a male is. So the abdomen is a really good one because if it's recently fed, it's going to make a lot. It's going to be a louder, more low frequency signal. Um, for ones that use more of these uh, sclerotized structures on on the on the exoskeleton, then those are set through development. So that might tell you like how well they developed before. And so females need all of these particular things. Interesting things about females is that there's, of course, very complex. The way females choose males in this instance is very complex. And so those are going to change. Different females are going to have different preferences. And we're trying to disentangle that. It's fun <laughs> and confusing. Would the, the viability of offspring be related to temperature? And, and might that have something to do for sure. So um, we've been doing a lot of thermal physiology experiments on these desert spiders because we think that that is going to be an incredibly key uh, component. For the desert spiders, one of the things that we just found out is that they have some of the most um, incredibly high heat tolerances than animals than any animals found, and they're being, they are they can really take a lot of heat. We don't know what the effect on development is, but. They definitely have adaptations to be able to um, deal with extreme temperatures. Yeah. So one of the things you could do that wouldn't happen in nature is you could artificially produce, let's say, low temperature male sounds at higher temperatures for the female and vice versa. Yes. Is that something? We, we're, we are. The way that we're going to do that is um, we're going to use an infrared laser. And so we're going to shine a laser on the male or female and then use that laser to heat them up. So, and we're going to have um, the laser be able to track them in real time. So what we're planning to do is actually heat up a male to a very different temperature than the female and then seeing what happens to their signals, to their behavior, and really get at, at like really, at that really fine scale resolution. At the same time, you're also tracking individuals in the field using thermal cameras to see where they are and what temperature they are, and then seeing how, if they have the choice, how they're maneuvering their thermal environment. So we're kind of doing a field, field part and a lab part. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about the, uh, the males making all the sound. So what are the females do? Are they, I mean, are males just going after any female, or do we? 
so um, this, of course, is going to be very specific to the system that uh, in question. There's a lot of systems where uh, there's duets. The, one of the Australian species, the one that was underneath the leaf, the female, they, they duet at some point. The habernatus, the ones that I was showing to, those um, females are um, basically, if they like what they see, they won't attack the male and they'll stay listening. So in those circumstances, there is no duets there. That's not the case in, in a lot of systems. No, I would say that it's all over the place. Um, you, the thing about spiders is that the females are usually, so spiders in general are very aggressive. Um, they're solitary for most of their lives until uh, mating interactions. Um, and in those cases, females are usually much, much larger. And so a lot of what they do is they'll listen, and then they'll either um, like, knock the ma like knock the males off the web or eat them. Uh, and sometimes they, um, what I think is happening in the Habernata system is that they have these postural, these very subtle postural shifts of whether they are interested or like, like want to attack them. And so I think what a male does is that it, he tunes his behavior and the intensity of it to the female response to it. So there's some more subtle duets, um, I think, going on. Yeah. You mentioned, do they have webs, the jumping spiders? Jumping spiders do not hunt using webs, but they use webs to make, uh, egg, so females use uh, webs to lay their eggs in. And they also build these little hammocks that they sleep in. OK, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is anthropogenic impacts um, and talk about the effects of anthropogenic noise, and in particular, in substrate borne noise. Now, anthropogenic and, and airborne noise is what I'm going to talk about first, is a really major issue of environmental concern. It's been something that, 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 um, that land managers and scientists have been uh, noticing lately that the, the noise that, say, cars and industry and, 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 um, and all of the things that we're producing are really having large impacts on animal behavior. For example, it really changes the, the pitches that birds are singing at. Birds are, are singing more higher and higher to sort of get past all of this anthropogenic noise. And so there's been a whole lot of work on birds. Now, of course, these are all vertebrates, right, that use airborne signals. 96% of all the studies on, on conservation, the effects of noise, are on vertebrates. The rest is on invertebrates. And so what I'm going to ask is, what about anthropogenic substrate borne noise? With the big caveat, with the big thing being that less than 1% of existing studies have examined substrate borne noise. So this is something we don't know anything about. So one of the things that's important is that any noise, so any noise source can create both airborne and substrate borne sounds. So even as I'm talking and you're hearing airborne sound, all the surfaces here, especially like things that are thin like this paper, are picking up the vibrations of my voice. Anything that has enough power to create um, airborne sounds is going to have some power that could be transferred over to surfaces and move solids. So that's the first important thing. Now, there have been a bunch of studies that substrate borne noise levels are affecting a whole bunch of different things. First there's good evidence that they're affecting species abundances. So this is a paper from Bunkley et al. from 2017. These are three different uh, insect groups, and these are the number of specimens found for them. And so basically, they compared areas that had com natural gas stations that had compressors, so something that is being a big, booming, a lot of substrate borne noise, and things that don't have a compressor, still have kind of industry, but they don't have that low pounding stuff. So Basically, you have high noise sites, which have compressors, and low noise sites, which do not have compressors. And what you notice here is that they have very strong impacts on the species that are found in those areas. So substrate buoyant noise is having an impact of the species that are found there. This is work from my lab, uh, Melanie Burrell, who just uh, did an honors thesis last year, did some work looking at mating behavior of wolf spiders. And so here you have two conditions. The first one here is a habituation trial. Were they raised on noise or not? Or were they kept in the lab in a noisy environment or not? 
And then the next one, and this is what um, to pay attention to, is the condition where we put them together. Was it a noisy condition or was it not? And what you see is that for um, the ones that had noise for it, it really depressed their mating rates. And so having a noisy environment really impacted the way that males and females were interacting with each other. It is also affecting parental care behavior. This is work from my graduate student, Maggie, Ro Maggie Roboin. And so she works on these spiders that are known as mason spiders. They're found in, um, in, they're found, um, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So this is a female here. What she does is she makes a little egg sac, sticks it in a rock, and then spends the entire day making thousands of trips to basically build these mounds made of little like sticks and pebbles and have these little turrets that protect the egg sac from the environment. And what she did is she looked at different sites that had a lot of road traffic versus not road traffic. And what she found is that in areas that had a lot of road traffic, they basically would, whether moving around, a car comes by, they kind of freak out and they stay still, and then they get lost. And then they have to find a long time trying to find, go back to their egg sac. And so what happens is they spend a lot of the time being lost and less time caring and provisioning for those egg sacs. If you look at the time away from mound, so this is time spent searching, for little bits, you find that in loud sites, they're spending more time looking, trying to find sticks. They're getting lost. They're, they're, it's just more difficult for them. While in quiet ones, they're doing these very efficient, going, grabbing sticks and pebbles and moving them back. And this has impacts on the survival of these spiders. So the impact of the environment, much like what we're finding in vertebrates, is having really strong impacts on, on invertebrates. And I think very importantly, so this is the thing I showed you before. Uh, this is from a review paper from African Slepicorn. If I just shove in my animals right here, what you find is that anthropogenic substrate point noise, because as I said before, there are a lot of low frequencies in there, it's likely going to be a major issue of environmental concern as well. But because substrate point signals tend to be much lower frequency, they're always going to basically overlap this anthropogenic noise one. So what we think is going on is that it's not only a major issue of concern, but it's likely affecting invertebrates much more than airborne noise. It's very difficult for um, these animals to produce high-pitched songs that are going to get past this biotic noise when it's much simpler for things like birds. Is there a difference in the transmission distances that you're seeing? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, definitely. definitely. So. Uh, it's going to depend on the frequencies and all those types of things. It's surprising how far substrate point signals will travel. There's some really interesting work that suggests that in, say, things that are on, like, on grape, grape plants will actually travel through the plant, through the roots, into another plant. Like, they, can be, they can travel quite a bit. The transmission, uh, it's very, uh, so substrate point ones are very frequency specific, so that gets very complicated. There is going to be differences, yes. When you were saying that the, the noise was interfering with their navigation, basically, does that mean they, they use the, the substrate, substrate sound to navigate? I think it's that it's um, not in that particular way. They're probably using, um, they're probably using um, uh, cues like visual cues or, or, or tactile cues. What I think was happening is that they're becoming distracted or stressed to the point that they lose where they, where they were before. I think that's what is what's particularly happening. In the mating system, that could mask it. That's like they're trying to signal in a part where, where they're, what they're listening to is just like drowned out by the, the cacophony of, of human stuff. Yeah. How about bees? You know, great concern over bees. Have there been studies on, on acoustic impacts on they have not, but definitely bees um, use substrate board signals in the comb to communicate with each other. So there's been no work on that, but I would suspect that there's going to be pretty strong impacts in the, in the hives and their ability to tell each other where food resources are. Yeah? These, uh, is mating all about vibration, or are, there, are chemical signals very important? With so... As with a lot of animals, there's, uh, different animals are going to use a whole bunch of different things. Chemicals are all oftentimes very, very important for arthropods. There's going to be some, like the jumping spars I've been showing, visual signals are going to be important. But I think that um, 
chemicals and substances, oh, most things, chemicals is probably the most ancient um, sense that we have, and so a lot of animals are going to be using it, probably second only to that. Substrate-borne signals are going to be the most important thing. It's going to vary by, between different animals. Spiders are really good at vibrations. <laughs> yeah. So is there, are, are there studies that try to reach conclusions about what's the role of this in a piece of loss of insect biomass? Uh, so I'm going to have a slide that basically says, like, this is why we should care about this more. No, and that's one of the things that um, we've been trying to, to sort of write grants to really sort of delve into this. And the problem is that only 1% of the studies have ever even talked a little bit about this. And, and a lot of them have been from my lab. And so it really becomes this major gap in our understanding. And with the loss of insect diversity, it becomes like this might be one of the major drivers and we really need to study it. Yeah. Uh, is there any study on the noise, noise uh, effects from the hikers versus bikers? No, that's, that's, uh, there has been no studies that I have seen um, about that. Um, I know one of my students wanted to look at bike trails because some uh, invertebrates like flattened bits of sand, and so that's bike trails, and so like um, a lot of crickets would go lay their eggs on there and mate on there, but then bikes are coming and destroying them all the time, and so it becomes this ecological trap. So, but yeah, there hasn't been any studies of those. The last thing I wanted to talk about is um, about substrate-borne signals and noise is that, so I showed this before. Now the thing about humans is, right, we're changing the environment, so the things that are there, we're putting different, we are removing some of the plants, but we're also putting our own things in, right? So we're putting in things like glass and concrete and metal. We're putting different things into the environment that didn't exist in their evolutionary history. And a lot of animals are using those substrates now to communicate. And some of the work from my lab, this is Rondel Hu, who uh, was um, a student that came to do, um, he came for a year into the lab. What he looked at is out in the Berkeley campus, what were the effects of of the orb weavers that we see all over the place, how was it affected if they were putting their anchor points on like glass and metal posts versus more just in trees? And so what he found out was that basically um, the artificial substrates were so homogenous that they did much more poorly in catching prey on those. And so we're not only affecting, we're affecting the environment by the amount of noise we put in, but because so many of these invertebrates are communicating on different surfaces. We're also changing and adding a new physical environment that they may they are not adapted to, and that is also driving these major impacts. So I hope what this talk has like uh, showed you is that invertebrates are important, and at least that they're vastly understudied, and that it's important to understand basic biological principles because if our goal is to understand what's happening in the nature. We should study what is out in nature, and to do so, we need to study things that we aren't, don't necessarily think of right away. We need to study insects and arthropods and spiders, things like that. Also, then this goes around to that, there's really important conservation implications. There, is a hu there has been recent studies that have been showing that there have been immense declines in insect populations and insect and arthropod populations. We don't know a lot of the root causes for this, but I feel that one of the things, because substrate-borne sound is such an important aspect of their natural history, that that could be one of the things, major drivers of that, and that needs to be investigated. And finally, I want everybody to just like realize that, you know, we have this amazing variety of, of diversity in life and things that are happening under our noses. Um, in those little blades of grass, if you recorded the, using a laser, it would sound like you were in a rainforest. Weird animals just singing all over the place, just a cacophony of these different substrate point sounds. This is happening around us, and you know, we're lucky that we have now have the technology to sort of crack into that and really sort of appreciate that. But also, it gives us some interesting ways of being able to really ask more basic scientific questions. And I guess with that, obviously, as a person running a lab, um, when I say we, it's the royal we. It's mainly other people doing the work at this point. So uh, there's a lot of people to thank, people from my lab, people whose work I, I, um, I acknowledged and, and were talking about. There were co-authors on papers. 
of course, the people that have offered me money, particularly the National Science Foundation and uh, the Hellman Fellows Fund and the Herman Slade Foundation. This is just something we've been working on, some educational video games. This is one based on spiders and how uh, different traits evolve. It's Spinder, you know, Tinder, uh -huh. <laughs> But yeah, so that's in our Ludo.com. And thank you very much. <laughs> Sound as an insecticide, you get a field. <laughs> yes. There is more work, um, so especially in um, in grape leaves and uh, in grapes, uh, there's been some groups in Europe and a very large. There's been I mean, groups in Europe, especially in Italy, that have been using uh, vibrations to ward off uh, grape pests. It's uh, a lot of, we recently, recently wrote uh, a review on anthropogenic noise effects, and so much of the work that there is an, even an impact has been from people using applied work where they shake plants, and then the things that eat them are staying away. So, so some of the things that people see and so are more attracted to, like flying insects, like moths and butterflies and things, I certainly see it degradation of those species, are they also using substrate sound? They do. So caterpillars are really sensitive. So caterpillars are really sensitive to substrate borne sound. Um, the, also, there are some, um, some lepidopterums, some like butterflies and moths that have these little clicking um, devices, that, uh, these little clicking ones that the presumption just from the other relatives or just in general the patterns that you found in insects that they're going to be using substrate borne sound. The problem has been that there's not a lot of people relative to the, the scientific, there's not a lot of people working on these, on these systems. The people that do find them everywhere. And so it's just getting more, more sort of people involved and looking particularly for those. But I would say yes, that those are the use substrate borne sound for sure. Is there a natural selection? Hmm? Is there a natural selection for here with the substrate? So if a plant disappears, does the species of insect disappear? Uh, yes. So um, definitely one of the things. Um, so insects. One of the one of the reasons that they're so diverse is that there's a lot of specialization. So uh, insect species becomes very specialized to a particular plant. Um, not only is their feeding there or where they lay eggs, but also their communication ends up being very specific to that particular plant. And so the more specialized you are, the more, those, the more that getting rid of that plant is going to lead to extinctions. Oftentimes, too, um, for example, at all of the jumping spiders that I work on are found in a very geographically isolated area. And so land use pattern changes are one of the major things that are, are driving um, these extensions in insects. The thing about insects is that if you find them somewhere, there are a lot of them, but they can only be found in one spot. There'd be a tons in one tree. You get rid of that tree, they're all dead, even though if in that one tree there's a bunch of them. But yes. Uh, there are laws about um, water pollution, air pollution. Are there any laws that protect you from noise? No, there's been um, there. I know that, and, and we're gonna try to start working with some of the land managers from natural from the national parks. Um, they're trying to sort of figure out how to um, sort of bring down the noise levels that are affecting um, species. That's been mostly focused on airborne noise, and so what we want to bring in is at least the measurement of the substrate borne noise compo component. So that is something that is hopefully gonna happen more, but um, not a lot of work on noise pollution yet. Especially for like ground living insects, um, for people if they have like a garden or something like that, is there an implication about the fact that since the waves are mostly surface borne, you, it would be non, it would it might not be that hard to isolate specific grounds from the sounds that are concerned? So for sure. So the the thing about I, I think that's a, that's a really good point. Um, Low frequencies, this is why elephants use low, really low frequencies, because they can travel for miles. It's going to be frequency specific. And so the low things, it's going to be hard to do that. But as you get higher and higher, um, it's going to be more easily to be able to isolate them. It's a little more complicated for that, but that is definitely a point. There are a lot of things that we could do because 
even though they're very sensitive to it, the the the, the drop in, in in vibrations is going to do that. We can we can come up with solutions. I think that might help. Yeah, I was thinking about your your presentation about temperature. Mm -hmm. It seems to me there's a little bit of a problem in studying this and causing this happening. If the temperature is higher, and let's say it raises, I don't know what the root cause is, but maybe it raises the metabolic rate of the females. Uh, are the males trying to adapt? Are they going higher because they're trying to adapt to that? Or could it be the other way around that, that maybe the abdomens don't stretch as much as the temperatures, and so maybe, you know, the frequencies they're transmitting at is, is different. So that's for sure. So one of the things that's very interesting is that you, we're talking about this really fun but very complicated relationship with like um, physiology constraints, physical constraints, um, what females are looking for. Can females sense a thing fast enough? And so when you sort of plot out how signals change through temperature, you get, and I didn't sort of present this data, you get very complex ones. You get plateaus. The plateaus are different for different signals. And this is where it becomes a very complicated thing for a female to be able to assess. OK, that signal plateaued at a different temperature than this other one, because one was with an abdomen and the other one was with their mouth parts. And so then it becomes this interesting thing. And this is where I think becomes interesting, where as you change temperatures, all the rules change, because all of them are going to have very specific physiological or physical constraints. And so the way that the song is put together is being modified. And so then the question is, are they adaptively modifying that to be like, oh, that thing is bad, so now I'm going to put this in there? Or is it just because all of these things are connected and uh, they have to uh, be done in a certain order? So that's an open question that we're really excited to, to look at in not only these spider systems, but in other systems, because I think that it's a major thing that is going to be happening with ectothermic animals that I think can be a, a lot of importance for applied and for more just basic research. They are all, com they are all, except for the high speed video, they are all kind of real time, no frequency shifting, just like straight off of the laser vibrometer into your ears. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the things that I, I really like about this work is that because you know, we can't send subtribal vibrations, but we're really good at airborne vibrations. It really lets us connect with, with these individuals, and I, try not to, and I try to modify them, like, not at all, because I think that it, it at least gets us, like, closer to. It's as close as we can to appreciating something that is completely invisible to us. Yeah. Early on, you had a uh, short video <clears throat> of, you said it was in your lab, and it was making us, uh, one of your pieces of equipment was making a sound simulating, or maybe it was the actual sound, and you were showing the, mm -hmm. what was, can you say so, yeah. that? That so, went by so fast. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so that is, um, so I talked about a laser vibrometer. One of the things I have in my lab is a scanning vibrometer. And so what you can do is you can map a surface. And so what you do is you put a signal in um, that's repeating, and then it takes different points of the surface, and then it builds them together so you can see how the surface would move uh, in three dimensions. And so what you were seeing there was we were playing in an insect sound. And then you saw a video of a whole bunch of different points that were then stitched together and then played back as a video. Has there been any research about the effects of our era of Wi-Fi and those types of things? Oh. No, I have not seen any of those. Those are going to be really high frequencies. Um, it'd be very interesting to, um, to see like what type of sense. They also have hairs that move very, very fast. Um, but I have not seen any of that work. I guess there's been some, the closest that I've seen to that work um, has been on moths and where they are landing. And the thought is that the um, things like cell phone towers are are affecting the electrical fields and, and like, like some, some animals, animals use electrical fields to sense their environment. Spiders, for example, when they balloon, they, they send out a strand of silk and then use electric fields to then just fly off into the air and move around. So that is probably something we can expect. Um, let's thank Professor Wallace again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Very cool. Thank you.